Chapter 10. The Piper. I'm sorry, the young woman cried. I don't have anything else. She whimpered as one of the thugs shook her violently by her collar before throwing her to the ground. Rass watched for a brief moment before he changed his course and made a direct line toward the scuffle. Wait here, he said over his shoulder. But I... Callie sputtered as Rass left. Rass walked along the right edge of the alley as quietly as he could so as not to be noticed by the two men. One held a wrench ready to strike the woman, while the other, a balding man with a mustache, grabbed her. Anyone? She cried desperately. The woman looked to be maybe all of five foot tall and had shockingly white, short, messy hair. Her frame made a large boom as the mustache man slammed her heart into the dumpster again. She let out an involuntary cry when she hit. Her lip was already bleeding and she was wide-eyed with panic. She slumped to the ground as the mustache man let her go. She noticed Rast approaching but tried not to make it obvious by turning her attention back to the two men. Can I just say one thing? What? The mustache man said with a grunt. He heard footsteps quickly approaching and turned to see a blur sprinting towards him, but before he had time to react, the blur had already wrapped its arms around his waist, planting a shoulder into his ribcage. The two crumpled into the ground with a hard thud followed by a sickening crack. Harris! He shouted before focusing on sucking in air and cradling his ribcage. Rass stood, catching his bearings just in time to duck out of the way of a large wrench aimed at his head. Go! Rass shouted to the young woman. She stood, but instead of running, she placed a swift, booted kick to the mustached man's midsection, expelling what air he had collected in the finest curse he knew. Rass flung himself at Harris in an attempt to wrestle the large wrench away, but recognized too late that it was a trick and quickly found himself flipped over the thug's shoulder, landing squarely on his back. Rass looked up to see the wrench swinging down and rolled out of the way just in time for the wrench to strike pavement instead of skull. Spinning on the ground, Rass solidly planted his heel into Harris's shin, eliciting a scream of pain. He could see the small woman digging around the jacket pockets of the mustached man, but didn't have time to wonder what she was doing. Rass tried to evade Harris's next swing by rolling out of the way, but he went the wrong direction, planting himself into the side of the dumpster and halting his escape. With nowhere to go, the wrench connected hard with Rass's left arm. He cried out in pain as the big man reached back to swing again. Rass! Callie called out. He heard a clattering sound grow louder as a metal pipe rolled down the alley, stopping against his leg. Rass dove to collect it and avoided the next swing of the wrench. Picking up the pipe, Rass swung low at Harris, connecting with the leg. Harris faltered from the blow and fell to one knee. Rass took the opportunity to jump onto Harris's back and press the pipe against the man's throat. Harris flailed wildly in an attempt to remove Rass and swung the wrench over his shoulder like an oversized fly swatter, almost connecting with Rass's head. The wrench instead slammed into Rass's shoulder. He winced but pulled the pipe even tighter, and Harris collapsed into a heap before he could swing the wrench again. Rass looked up to see the mustached man down for the count as well. He shakily came to his feet, looking for Callie, who stood fifteen feet away, clutching her books. "'Are you all right?' she asked Rass. Before he could respond, the small, white-haired woman stood up from behind the dumpster and launched herself at him. "'Thank you, thank you, thank you!' She wrapped her arms around him, then put her hands on the sides of his face, stood on her toes, and kissed him full on the lips. "'You saved me! Oh, I could kiss you! Wait, I just did. I'm sorry, I just got caught up in the moment,' she said rapidly with an almost childlike voice. She released his face, freeing Rast to touch his lips, still in shock. He felt a slight stickiness as he pulled away to see a bit of the woman's blood. Callie unclenched her jaw before speaking. "'What happened here?' The sprite-like woman turned on her heel to face Callie. Oh, not just here. About half a dozen of them attacked me in the library. These two are just the most persistent. She leaned over, grabbing the wrench from Harris's hand and offered it to Rass with a deep bow. A trophy to commemorate your great victory and to remember the day you saved Dixie Piper. Rass hesitantly accepted the makeshift weapon. Dixie offered her hand next. People call me Dix, Dixie, Pip, Piper, Piper, and I hate all but two of those, so choose wisely. She winked. Rass. Pleasure he said, still a bit shaken from the wrench strikes. He took her hand and gave a nod. Pleasure. Say, could we not be here when those two wake up? Dixie asked, pointing a finger and oscillating it between the two men. So the library was you? Callie asked. Indirectly, Dixie said, chagrined. Again, may I stress the importance of not remaining here? Yeah, we should, uh, we should go, Rass said, still a bit stunned. He shoved the wrench under his belt and began to walk back toward the alley entrance. He looked over to see Dixie walking quickly to keep pace. She was clad in tight-fitting gray pants draped with a couple belts over her slender waist, a white shirt marred with a few drops of blood, and a fashionably cut purple leather jacket. Why were they attacking you? Rass asked. Oh, them? They don't like me, Dixie said dismissively. Any reason in particular? Callie asked. I kind of got their boss put in jail, she said. Sky pirates. Hate them. You two aren't pirates, are you? Of course not. You don't look the type. Besides, sky pirates don't help people in alleys that are about to get killed. The speed at which she spoke dizzied Rass. Uh, Dixie, sorry to interrupt your conversation, but do we need to get you somewhere safe? Rass asked. Me? She asked. I am somewhere safe. I'm with you, she said with a winning smile. They made it back to the sidewalk outside of the alley. And I dare say that I owe you something of a favor. That's not necessary. I was just trying to help, Rass said. And you succeeded. So now I'm trying and hopefully I'll succeed as well. Are you from Duralier? She asked. 
Do we look that out of place? Ras asked, keeping his eye out for more flyers. Oh, no, 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 not that. Just most people aren't from here, and I'm something of an immensely talented tour guide if there's anything you're looking for, Dixie said. What happened in the library? Callie asked unsympathetically. Ah, yeah, that. Well, one of them grabbed me from behind, so I kicked off a bookshelf to break free, which worked, but then I started climbing a shelf to when they grabbed me by the ankles to pull me back down. Book avalanche. She made a sound with her mouse to replicate an explosion. And mass destruction. Might as well cut up my library card, huh? Do you know of any pocket watch shops? Rast asked to pull the subject away from Callie's ire. Dixie lit up. Ooh, a request. Excellent. Let's see, uh, pocket watches, pocket clocks, there's Crimin's, Badgers and Founts, the gear outlet, Orville's, the golden calendar. Wait, Rast said, the Orville one. What's that? That's about two miles away. Bit of a walk, Dixie said. Back on 8th and Holloway. Rast looked at his watch. We have time. Dixie stopped walking and almost caused Rast and Callie to pile into her. Let's just take my skiff. Oh, we wouldn't want to impose, Callie said. No, really. Stay right here and give me ten minutes. I'll swing by on the channel. She was off and lost to the crowd almost instantly. Rass and Callie stood awkwardly for about a minute. What if she sees your wanted poster? Callie asked. I don't think she's big enough to drag me into a police station, he said. You know, unless she drives us there unwittingly while telling us we're heading to a pocket watch shop. Rass trailed off. We should probably go. Good call, Callie said as she fished out the map. My dad used to tell me about how it was a clock shop with no ticking, Rass said. They started the watch when you bought it. It was like starting a moment, but my dad would always bring me watches that hadn't been started and ask me what I wanted most. We'd wind the watch together, and he told me if I worked hard, it'd just be a matter of time before it was mine. That was sweet of him, Kelly said, her demeanor finally softening to the usual state. Yeah, but life doesn't exactly work like that. No, but having a father who encourages you goes a long way, she said as she pulled out the map. Come on. We can at least see if she wasn't lying about Orville's being on Ethan Holloway. You can tell me on the way what little Rass wanted most. She put her arm through his and they began walking. Telling her what he wanted most would make for a long and awkward trip across Atmo if she didn't reciprocate the feeling. I'm afraid I can't, he said. Doesn't come true if you tell anyone. That's birthday candles and shooting stars. You already said all it takes is time. She nudged him and all he could smell was the intoxicating scent of strawberries and vanilla. You just don't want to say. I think a boy is entitled to his secrets, Rass said. What about you? Any falling star wishes you'd never told me about? I always wish I would leave the basement and see the world, but that's not a secret. She looked up at him with her perfect blue eyes. You want to know a secret? Sure. You can't tell anyone. That's how secrets work, I hear. Well, she began. If anyone was to kidnap me, I'm glad it was you. It was the nicest, strangest compliment Rass had ever received. You've been a perfectly pleasant prisoner. No annoying escape attempts, no running to the police. You've really made my kidnapping a positive experience, he said, laughing. You know, my arm really hurts. It was a rather large wrench. Do you think it's broken? No, but I've seriously got to start taking better care of this arm. He lifted his left shoulder, wincing. You've got to start taking better care of you. I don't do that well, do I? He asked. That's not one of your stronger suits, no. It took them almost an hour to find Orville's, as 8th and Holloway held three different vertical levels. Orville's was on the bottom level, which was a small mercy. At least they wouldn't be out in the open. A clock face comprised the O in the Orville sign, which wasn't terribly clever, but gave any passerby a clear idea of what to expect inside. Callie opened wide one of the shop's ornate brass doors, sweeping a hand with great ceremony. Oh, stop it, Rass said. It's just a... Wow. Rass's eyes went wide as he passed through the threshold. The thirty-foot-tall walls appeared to consist entirely of clocks. Hundreds upon hundreds of devices hung so densely packed that the walls only peeked out in various places where a purchase clock had not yet been replaced. But, just as Elias had described, there was absolutely no ticking, which Rass found both eerie and fascinating. The showroom held displays full of watches, pocket clocks, and other assorted geared items with tiny price tags attached. This place is incredible, Callie said, her fingers lightly brushing a display. The sound of winding and a faint ticking noise drew their attention to a balding man standing behind the counter. His thick glasses gave his face a pinched appearance. Smiling, he placed the newly wound watch in a velvet box for the customer in front of him. I'm sure she'll love it. I wish you both luck, he said. Rass watched the only other customer in the store pass by with his new purchase before the door chime marked his exit. The large room once again fell silent until the man behind the counter called out. How can I help you, young sir? Are you Orville? Rass asked and was met with a nod. My father always told me about your shop, so I thought I'd see it for yourself. I'm pleased you did, Orville said. May I ask your father's name? I have a rather encyclopedic memory. Rass approached Orville's counter. It's been a while since he shopped here. Hold on. You look familiar, he said. Do you take after your father? He doesn't think so, Kelly said, but he's wrong. Hmm, 
Give me a moment. He studied Rass's face carefully. Are you wearing a Parkman 51 with a brown leather strap on your left wrist? Rass pulled back his jacket sleeve, revealing the watch, which looked small for his arm. The inappropriate size wasn't enough to have discontinued use of his last birthday present from his father. Orville closed his eyes. It's due for cleaning, Erasmusphere. I told Elias it requires maintenance every year, but the second hand is sticking, isn't it? Rass smiled. It waits three seconds before it ticks, but it keeps time. It's well past warranty, but if I may, Orville held out a hand. With the watch surrendered, Orville held it to his ear, then gently placed it on a black felt cloth and pulled out a small set of fine, shiny tools. He adjusted a pivotal magnifying glass for a better look. I have something to give you, Erasmus, but it pains me to do so, Orville said as he popped the back of the watch off and went to work. Why is that? Because your father would place an order for you on his trip out. I would build it to his specifications. He always provided me with such challenges. And he would pick up the finished work on his way home. I didn't know that, Rass said. Orville adjusted a gear, then held the watch to his ear and replaced the back before returning it to Rass. Almost good as new. Without requesting payment, he turned and disappeared into the storeroom. Rass gave Callie a perplexed look. Ah, uh, found it. Orville called out and returned, holding a small box with a couple envelopes taped to the bottom of it. What's this? Rass asked. The last assignment Elias gave me. He slid the box across the counter. I'm sorry. I'm sure we both wish he was the one picking this up. Your father loved you dearly, Orville said, then took a moment to compose himself. He lit up when he spoke of you and would always tell me how you'd react when he came home with the latest. Orville, please. The man nodded knowingly. My apologies, young sir. Are the envelopes for me? One is, he smiled sadly. Would you like me to wind up the clock for you? I'm afraid what I want most right now isn't possible. Rass picked up the box, which had a surprising heft to it. He slid the top off of it, revealing a clock like he had never seen before. It was a glass ball with a brass porthole on its perimeter. Inside, the clock had a graceful design, as if the hands had been moving. They would have looked like they were swimming through glass. It's beautiful. You made this? Callie asked. One of a kind, Orville said. Rass picked up the envelopes. One said Rass, and the other Emma. The shop didn't feel like a proper venue to read his father's final words to him, but he wasn't certain what venue would feel right. He slid the envelopes into his jacket pocket. Did he leave a letter every time? No, just the one in case you eventually visited, Orville said. Which you did. I do feel honored to have been entrusted with such a thing, but I am also glad that I lived long enough to see it through. Rass lifted the round glass ball of a clock. If one didn't look at it directly, the curvature of the glass would obscure the face the way that looking at the side of an eye showed the iris differently. Do I owe? Rass began. Orville waved dismissively. Paid in full. Elias was always up front in his dealings. Rass placed the clock back in the box. Thank you, he said quietly. Back at the entrance, the door squeaked on its hinges. Over some of the taller displays, a bit of white hair quickly bobbed forward. Dixie turned the corner, continuing her quick strides. She was not pleased. I offer you a ride and you ditch me. Can't a girl return a favor? Well, we thought a walk would do us good. See more that way, Rass said as he slid the box into his pocket to join the envelopes. He noticed Dixie's eyes track it. Sorry about that, but we wound up here all together, so you're off the hook. Trust me, you don't want me to be off the hook. If you don't let me give you a ride right now, we're both liable to be on sharp, pointy hooks for a long, long time, and nobody wants that. Except for the people with the hooks. Pardon? Callie asked. Look, I saw the posters, Dixie said, so I get why you ditched me. But if we keep talking here, we're going to be seeing about a dozen boys in blue, and my hands aren't entirely clean after the whole library debacle. I don't have to be here, but I take favors seriously. So, if you would kindly come with me so I can get you out of here... Where's your skiff? Callie asked. Just follow me, Dixie said, then began to leave as Rass looked back toward all... Just follow me, Dixie said. They began to leave and Rass looked back at Orville. Thank you for everything. You come back and get that cleaned every year now, Orville said. None of this ten years later business. Rass smiled sadly and nodded. They made it out to the shop and onto the busy sidewalk. Rass spotted a squad of derailleur police forcing their way through the crowd, and as soon as they spotted Rass, Callie, and Dixie, they began aggressively shoving people out of the way. Dixie ran up to the ledge of the airship channel, unhesitatingly planted a hand on the railing, and vaulted herself into the abyss. Her disembodied voice shouted, Jump! Rass and Callie looked over to the edge to see a small four-seater open-air skiff idling below the railing. Callie began climbing over the railing with Rass's assistance. She dropped the five feet ungracefully into the back seat as her bowler hat blew off to the deep below. 
Watching a hat made Rass freeze. All of the shouting from the police, Dixie, and Callie became muffled, and he found himself acutely aware of his heartbeat. He had five seconds before the closest officer would reach him. Dixie huffed, pulling up on the controls to raise the skiff to the railing's level. Rass climbed onto the rail just in time for one of the officers to get a fistful of Rass's pant leg. The alteration of balance kept him from doing anything but grasping the rising skiff's door handle as it continued to lift. Rass ascended with a small ship. His hold was tenuous as he kicked free from the officer, and his legs flailed wildly as Dixie's skiff accelerated. Dixie! Rass shouted. He looked down and fought the urge to black out as the skiff sped forward. The wail of sirens grew behind them. Hold on tight, then don't, Dixie said. What? He tightened his grip on the handle as best he could. They weaved through the airship traffic, then suddenly the skiff rolled hard counterclockwise, and Rass immediately found himself on top of the sideways vessel. Let go! Dixie shouted as she shunted the skiff into a nosedive. Rass lost his grip completely. He grasped fistfuls of air as the large vessel leveled out and shifted to starboard. The top of the passenger door connected with his ribcage, halting his fall. Callie didn't miss a beat. She grabbed Rass's hand, hauling him inside. Sorry, Dixie said. That should have gone better. Rass fought the urge to hyperventilate as Callie grabbed the seat's restraints and buckled him in. There, you're safe now, she said. The sirens grew louder. I wouldn't say that yet, Dixie said. She threw the ship down another avenue, then dove through the lowest level of traffic. The air around them grew hotter as they continued lower and pulled even with the railier's gigantic engines. Four police skiffs dove in pursuit. If we go any lower, the exhaust will boil us, Rass shouted over the deafening roar. Then we won't go lower. Dixie shouted. The engine array of derailleur would have fascinated Rass under more serene conditions. Over 50 engines working in league with humongous fuel reservoirs kept the city afloat. Each major city section has given its own engine and then bolted to its neighbors in case of a regional failure, Dixie shouted. Why does that have to do with anything? Callie asked. Just thought you might find it interesting. I said I was a great tour guide. Rass looked around in an attempt to spot the four pursuing skiffs, but the heat emissions distorted anything underneath the engines. Just so you know, I don't exactly have a place to hide, she shouted. I thought you said you lived here, Callie said. Nope. Where's your ship? East side. Flint's. Barely got the word out before Dixie slammed the steering wheel hard to starboard and pulled up to ascend back into the city. The drone of the engines dulled as they rose. Do you think Flint is going to be finished with the upgrade by now? Callie asked, pressed firmly into her seat, her fingers digging into the upholstery. If he isn't, we might not get much further, Rass said. He leaned forward to talk to Dixie, who had just merged in with traffic on the second level of the three vertical intersections. What about you? What are you going to do after you drop us off? Well, I'm probably just going to have to give them a bit of a chase so they don't follow you to your ship, now won't I? Maybe by the end you'll owe me a favor, she said with a peal of laughter. You two are a lot of fun. You'll make beautiful children. She lifted the ship to the top level of the vertical intersections, once again throwing Rass and Callie back into their seats. Wait, what did she say? Callie asked. Oh, she and I, we're not, you know, Rass said, stammering. Why not? Dixie asked. Flashing lights began reflecting off buildings and airships as they sat in gridlock traffic. That's kind of personal, Rass said. He looked over at Callie, who blushed. Why aren't we moving, Callie said. They're getting closer. Dixie looked over at the side of the skiff, calculating something. I'm not moving until one of you two tells me why you two aren't together. Dixie, Rass shouted. I'm doing you a favor, hun, she said. What are you spoken for? More police skiffs flew above traffic for a good vantage point and would spot them at any moment. No, we're not. Now, would you please move? Callie asked. You're risking the lives of tens of thousands of people with your stupid game. I'm logging that one under things to ask about later, Dixie asked, turning to Rass. She said, come on, ask her before I ask you. Spotlights popped on, blinding them, and a voice came over the loudspeaker, ordering them to stay right where they were. Fine, Rass yelled. Callie, let's get dinner sometime. That's not asking, Dixie said. Callie, would you do me the honor of having dinner with me? Rass asked with more sincerity than he expected. The police continued to shout over their loudspeakers. Callie looked frozen. Well? Dixie asked, once again staring over the side of her skip before she cut power to the engines. They began to plummet past the second intersection's traffic, almost clipping an airship, and down to the first intersection where the skiff struck a floating traffic sign but managed to miss everything else. She turned the key and their fall halted just before they reached the burning engine exhaust. Callie, what do you say? I say you're insane, she said, eyes narrowing. Callie, it's okay, Russ said. She was just buying us time so the police would have to push through three intersections of traffic. He turned to Dixie. Can we please just get to Flint's? The skiff turned east. You got it, Dixie said with a sigh. I really thought that was going to work. I really did. It was a two-minute flight to Flint's, and as Rass suspected, police skiffs were parked outside. Really? Dixie said, smacking the steering wheel. Let's see if we can't sneak in the back. No? Wait. Better idea. Get out. She pulled up to the sidewalk a block away from Flint's. Go on. Freebie on me for what I did earlier. What are you going to do? Rass asked. I'll draw them away and you get back to your ship, she smiled. Maybe we'll see each other again someday. Dixie nodded to the curb. Mind your step. Rass unbuckled and stepped out, followed by Callie, who hadn't said much since the drop. They stood beside the skiff as Dixie winked at them, then jetted forward on a collision course with the police skiffs, sideswiping each of the parked vehicles. 
They watched police file out of Flint's. Dixie stood in the driver's seat, waving at the men, blowing them kisses as they piled into the damaged vehicles. She sat back down and scooted away as the police gave chase. Why do I get the feeling that skiff isn't hers? Kelly asked. They approached Flint's cautiously in case any more officers were still posted outside. Rast decided to enter through the repair bay instead of the main office doors. Above them hung the brass fox. Nobody was working on it, and Rass reasoned that the police would frown on Flint's aiding criminals. They weren't more than a few steps into the hangar before a mechanic spotted them. Hey, he whispered, waving them over. Rass spotted two policemen patrolling the catwalk up by Flint's office, still ignorant of the intruders, so he led Callie along the wall over to the mechanic. The man had a buzzed haircut and a name patch that said Sarks. About time you two showed up. Flint wants to talk. Sark said, leading him toward a door marked employees only, then pushed it open. They walked into a dark room with Sark springing up the rear. He flicked on a light switch and the door closed behind him. Rass's eyes adjusted to the light just as two mechanics grabbed his arms, both restraining him and reminding him exactly where the wrench struck him back in the alley. A dozen other workers in mechanic jumpsuits lined the walls of the locker room and Flint stood at the center. Rass chose not to struggle. What's going on? Callie demanded. Flint towered over her, holding the wanted and kidnapped posters. Both have rewards attached to him. He took another step towards Callie. Care to explain? Rass began to speak, but a mechanic twisted his arm, turning his words to painted grunts. Not you. Her, Flint said. He didn't kidnap me. The fox is technically mine. Check the title. I bought it to retrieve something for Hal so he would save Verdant. Flint gave her a hard look, then flicked his gaze to Rass. Is he the one that killed the last convergence in the bowl? Yes, Callie said. But if you turn us in for a reward, you're sinking an entire city, and I'll tell everyone, and I mean everyone, that will listen exactly who acted like a sky pirate and stopped the city's last chance for survival over a little reward money. She stood resolute as Flint's eyes turned to her, and I doubt you'd ever get another chance to work on the Kingfisher. Flint glared at her for a long moment, then looked to Sarks. Get them some jumpsuits and back aboard their ships. Distract the cops. Thank you, Callie said. You drive a hard guilt trip, Missy, said Flint. With a quick outfit change and an entrance through the bay doors to the hold, Rass, Callie, and Sarks walked aboard the Brass Fox. We didn't have time to test the Helios engine, Sark said, but we'll release the ship from mooring after I leave the hold. You hear three clicks. On the third, you'll be pushed forward. Stay below and we'll act like it's an accident. Just turn on your engines once you clear the building and you should be good to go. You're being a lot nicer about this than Flint, Rass said. I'm a Verdantian, born and raised. Got family still there that I'd like to go back and see sometime, Sark said. I'm rooting for you. With that, Sarks left the hold. Rass walked over to inspect the Helios engine. It was covered in a shiny but flimsy chrome encasement with Helios logo stamped all over. The solid metal Windstrider engines were twice its size and looked like they would easily outlast the Helios. Click. The ship rumbled and Rass braced himself against an unfamiliar barrel next to the engine. Rass had never seen refined energy fuel up close. Click. Another shake. Rass looked at Callie. You ready to be navigator? Click. They began to drift and shouts came from outside. No, but I'll get there. You'll be great, Rass said, smiling at her. Outside, the shouts continued and Rass could hear Sarks yell, Stop it! It's almost completely outside! Subtle, Rass said, then climbed the ladder to get above deck. Once up top, he maintained the ruse of being on Flint's staff by shouting, Hold on, I got it! He ran up to the helm and started the engines. They roared to life with a vigor Rass didn't know was possible, and the brass fox took off with an uncharacteristic start. Flint's men had done their job well. Rass bobbed and weaved through traffic the short distance to the eastern entrance. I'm going to need an Abbey, he called out to Callie, looking back at Derelier. He couldn't spot any obvious pursuers. They looked to be in the clear, finally. Foster Helios III's face burned with anger. We worked very hard to ensure that every cop sent to Flint's was in our pocket. How did they get away? The lackey walking down the hallway with him began to speak, but Foster cut him off. What have we learned from Flint? The man in uniform paused awkwardly. He spoke nonsense. I'll take the information unfiltered, thank you, Foster said. He said the pilot had a deal with Napier. Burn his whole operation, he ordered. Make sure the Halifax is prepped for departure, and in the meanwhile, see if we can't find out where they were headed. Sir, your ship is supporting the engagement against the Sky Pirates outside Nalon. Pulling away now would- I am well aware of the ramifications. I'm telling you where it needs to be. Now, he barked. I'll just have to find them myself.